Assalamu alaikum, um, brothers and sisters. Um, welcome and thank you for coming. Um, today we're delighted to have Sister Zara Faris. Um, she's a graduate in Arabic and Islamic studies from the uh, from Soas University. Uh, she's a uh, Muslim researcher and speaker and a member of the uh, Muslim Debate Initiative. And she's uh, actively spoken nationwide on topics like women's rights, hijab, and the niqab ban. Uh, today she's going to present the talk on women in Islam, oppressed or liberated. So without further ado, Sister Zara Fari. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wassalatu wassalam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum and greetings to everybody and thank you so much for coming here this evening to listen to this topic. Now the topic is women in Islam, however I'm not just going to do the usual description of women's economic rights, uh, women's political rights and women's social rights in Islam. I'm going to do things from a few different angles because we've heard most of those off the shelf kinds of lectures before and they're very useful to hear but we hear them year in and year out but we still have the same questions. So I'm going to try and tackle some of the misconceptions and I'm going to try and talk about some of the interrogating forces and why they ask questions about women in Islam in the way that they do and the types of questions that they raise. But I will include some of those useful and very important facts about what Islam does say about women at the relevant junctures in this presentation. Over the last year or even the last decade, we've heard a number of claims mainly targeted at Muslim women claiming that Muslim women are oppressed. And now such claims have generally or largely been dominated by feminists, liberal feminists, who cite quote, um, things such as equality, freedom and empowerment, these three magic buzzwords that uh, we often hear bandied around. So they talk about Muslim women being oppressed. The reality, however, is that Muslim uh, people, men and women, human beings around the world of many faiths and none are oppressed in today's society. Consider the example of the Tunisian Muslim man, Muhammad Bouaziz, who set himself on fire, effectively igniting the Arab Spring. Why did he do that? He was frustrated by the unemployment, the corruption, and the tyrannical rule in his country. And he, like many thousands of hundreds of thousands of Egyptian, Tunisian, and Algerian men, all just wanted to provide for their families with dignity, but they were unable to. And this is what sparked the Arab Spring, but we don't call that a men's rights issue. We don't say Muslim men are oppressed. But when we hear issues about women, suddenly we say, oh, it's a woman's issue. Muslim women are oppressed. While there's wholesale oppression worldwide, it's quite flattering that Muslims are always taken to task on how we treat our women, as if to say that we should have a higher standard, and it's true that we do. But in reality, complaining that just Muslim women are oppressed is like complaining that you know the door of the house is not painted properly when in fact the entire house is burning down and we're all on the street watching. So let's consider some of the recent claims made against Muslim women and I'm going to look at three. I'm going to look at three claims that have come up um, perhaps in the last year and some of them have come up recurrently throughout history but here's some that are more fresh in our minds. So the first one is the matter of gender segregation. Now, most of you here, I imagine, are students, so you may know about what happened very recently at another university where uh, they were having a gender segregated event. They didn't have like enforced gender segregation. They were having an educational event, and in the audience, which was um, a large proportion of those were Muslim, Muslim people were choosing voluntarily to segregate. So women chose to sit kind of in one area, and men generally chose to sit in another area. So they voluntarily chose to segregate. Yet Muslims were under fire for allowing this to happen. They said with a straight face, that Muslims were told with a very straight face, it's a gross inequality and it's an oppression on women to voluntarily segregate from men at educational events. And they said that this should be officially regulated against and universities are now looking at how to police where people sit when they attend um, educational events, extracurricular events at universities. And most curiously, Muslims were told that this practice is against British culture. So they were told, one, it's misogynistic and it's oppressive to women. And secondly, they were told that it's, you know, it's, it's completely alien to British culture. So the Telegraph published articles like, uh, statements like, requesting that women in a public uh, place sit separately away from men is entirely alien to 21st century British culture. Now, 
Not only is this completely hypocritical, given that in this country we already have gender segregated schools, we have boys only schools, we have girls only schools, we have boy scouts, we have girl, uh, girl guides, we have segregated PE, we even have Eton, a male only school, of which there is no female equivalent. So to now suddenly be told that just because if you're Muslim you do it, suddenly it's alien to British values, um, is, is, uh, we find that quite laughable. Not only that, but saying that if I choose to sit with a woman rather than man, somehow I'm lowering myself, says more about their ideas of women than it does about mine. So we're told that we must conform to the British perspective on the matter, and if we don't, that Muslim women are basically complicit in our own oppression. So that's the first example, and I'm going to link these all up at the end and you'll see where I'm going. So the second one is the topic of gender roles. So the Muslim experience in Britain is, for mu many Muslim women, is this kind of ongoing and growing allegation that Muslim men are misogynists and Muslim women are either brainwashed, complicit in their own oppression, or they're suffering from some kind of Stockholm Syndrome, similar to being brainwashed where they're oppressed but they don't know it and they love their oppression. So take the claims against what are made against the life choices of those women, many of them Muslim, who do not want to be CEOs, they don't want to win Nobel Prizes, they may not want to be the next Miley Cyrus, but those women you know, who want to serve their creator, those Muslim women who want to serve their creator, and have chosen that the way to do this is by being a good wife and a good mother. However, when we say this, for those of us that do aspire to that, we're told that this is not a worthy aspiration. We're told that this is a disservice to a woman's full potential. How dare anyone tie your worth as a woman to a man? But this rather sexist claim that tends to originate from liberal feminists is quite rich and it's pretty hypocritical. But firstly, it's made because they don't believe that women should be defined or valued in relation to men. Now, why is this hypocritical? Firstly, it's ironic because the whole thrust of feminism comes from distorted feelings of inadequacy and constant comparisons of women to men. How much men earn, what jobs men do, what roles men take. Not only that, but the concepts that feminists advocate such as equality, freedom, individualism, these are also created by men. You know, at some point in European history, men came up with the concepts of equality, freedom, empowerment, and yet feminists take these terms and say, uh, you know, it's okay if we do it, but you can't take a culture that they believe is formulated by men, but we can use it to kind of, you know, um, say that you're not doing justice to, to womanhood. Now, if feminists are aghast at the idea of women choosing to seek uh, virtue or righteousness through, you know, anything related to men, such as being a wife or being a mother, they're even more aghast when we explain to them that actually we don't do it for men. And actually, we don't do it for ourselves either. Rather, we do it to empower a way of life that we believe in. And in Islam, the role of the mother and the wife, whilst it is not the sole role, because Islam does not, uh, is not, doesn't straightjacket people into roles, it is a highly esteemed role. So for us, when we do it, it's giving, uh, giving life to that way of, uh, of, of existence and giving power to that and empowering our religion. Indeed, Ultimately, the prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that even men's virtue would be measured in relation to their wives. He said to the men, the best among you, he said the best among you, speaking to the men, are those who are best to their wives. So if for over, you know, being a good husband has for over 1400 years been considered a virtue amongst Muslims, why is it suddenly oppressive, restrictive and misogynistic for a woman who seeks the equivalent? Now, I'm going to come on to the final example. So first we had the issue of gender segregation and then we had the issue of gender roles. And now I want to talk about the final one, which is the subject of the niqab. Now, until recently, any debate over the Muslim face veil, uh, the niqab, so when we're talking about the niqab, just for a clarity of terms, we mean the uh, cloth that not only covers the rest of you, but also covers the face, so all you see is the eyes. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the niqab. And so until recently, any debate about the niqab has been pretty academic, because so few women actually wear the niqab, then, then, but then don't wear the niqab. So instigating a national debate has in a way been like hunting 
mosquitoes with nuclear weapons. I don't know if anybody ever used to watch Monty Python, but there was one episode where the Monty Python gang decide that they're going to go hunting for mosquitoes and they decide to use big bazookas and cannons and these really inordinately and disproportionately large weapons against these tiny, tiny creatures. And this debate has been very much the same. And yet the idea was planted earlier in the minds of the people, earlier this year, and now it's slowly being manured with arguments and excuses and reasons as to why, if not a legal ban, then it must be socially discouraged, i.e. it should be bullied out of society. And so we're told things like it's not civilised. So one newspaper published the following title saying, Civilised society must not draw a veil over the niqab. So when we choose to cover in a certain way or practice a certain uh, definition of modesty, we're told that it's not even civilised. Now, objectification itself needs no real introduction. But I'm going to give you some statistics. So a study conducted, for example, by Harvard and LSE showed that almost two-thirds of women thought that society expects women to enhance their physical attractiveness and they thought that women who are more beautiful have greater opportunities in life. And more than half of women thought that physically attractive women are more valued by men. So in essence, it found that women see beauty and physical attractiveness as increasingly socially mandated and rewarded. Not only this, but further research found that six out of 10 girls stop doing things they love because they feel so bad about how they look. So how's that for liberation? Now, it's quite interesting because animal biologists have uh, done certain experiments and they basically found that living creatures could be made more responsive to exaggerated forms of visual stimuli, so much so that they would start to neglect what is natural. So they did, for example, um, one experiment where they observed uh, a bird's nest where they had the mother bird who was at the stage, or, or, or the parent bird, who was at the stage of feeding the, smaller, the, the small newly hatched chicks. And these birds were kind of blue with like a little yellow beak. And what they did was they put in a fake bird into that nest and they made it much bigger than the others. And they made it a really shocking shade of blue and they made the beak huge and yellow so that basically it was basically an exaggerated form of the natural bird. And they wanted to see what the feeding, what the, the bird that was feeding them, the mother bird, would do. And the mother bird, when she brought food back, she would only feed the artificial bird and completely neglect the others. And what that shows, they found also, this is also replicated in human behavior as well. The fact that human beings can focus so much on artificially enhanced and exaggerated forms of beauty such that what is normal in creation is ignored. And we see this with the concepts of objectification today such that um, men are chasing what is an unrealistic and exaggerated form of beauty and women too are chasing that form of beauty. And it's quite funny because, well it's not funny, it's very sad because recently I was uh, travelling on the tube and you know the tube was pretty packed and uh, you know I was standing and so you, you know how people kind of sit in London, if you, when you travel in London uh, people sit and they read their papers and uh, there was one man kind of sitting, um, you know, sitting down and uh, he was reading The Sun um, and so you may know where I'm going with this, if you don't, on uh, basically The Sun is a traditional um, English newspaper and the third page every day features nudity basically and um, so this man was reading the paper and uh, he was sat between two women and so he stopped on the, he opened the newspaper and he basically, he basically stopped on the third page and he lingered there for a good maybe five, ten minutes and I was thinking that's disgrace. I was thinking, one, you know, it's, it, in of itself, it is abhorrent. In of itself, it's abhorrent. But secondly, he was sitting next to two ladies, and I was thinking to myself, imagine if his wife knew. Imagine if one of those was his wife. And do you know what? It turned out one of those women next to him was actually his wife, and she had just resigned to this reality. She just resigned to this reality, exactly like the nest example where the mother bird is giving all the attention to this exaggerated thing and completely neglecting what is natural and what is meant for it. Similarly, we see this in human behavior as well, except that human beings are supposed to be elevated by their intellect. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be different from the animals because of our ability to discern these differences. 
So for Muslims, covering up is a form of liberation. It's a liberation from, uh, for example, uh, not just what we consider to be, you know, male lechery, but also from, uh, you know, jealousy amongst women, just generally being able to participate in society by reducing this element of, you know, tension between men and women. It's supposed to minimize that tension. Of course, it never completely eliminates it, but it's intended to eliminate, uh, to minimize it as much as possible. And so for Muslims, covering up, whether it's the niqab or the hijab or the, or the different levels of kind of modesty, um, the, the minimum being everything is covered but the face and hands. This is for Muslims a passport to participate fully in public life so that we can go around with our, you know, our, daily, our daily work. We can participate fully in different fields, science, medicine, education, or just go about our daily lives. This is a passport and it's interesting to note that I discovered recently that the etymology of the word niqab actually means um, to make a piercing or to travel through a place. And for many Muslim women who wear the hijab or the niqab, it actually does feel like that. It feels like there's this environment and you're basically piercing it and traveling through kind of unseen, you know, doing your thing. And it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. It's like perforating society with your presence, but in a, but in a kind of, for us, a dignified, a dignified and liberating way that makes, um, that makes our lives easier rather than harder. For many of the antagonizers of our concepts of modesty, and some of these uh, angles come from some feminists, however, the idea that a woman should practice modesty is in itself, for them, the affirmation of a patriarchy. Now, just to clarify terms, when feminists use the word patriarchy, they mean basically generally male domination that has disadvantaged women throughout history. So they see that uh, our concepts of modesty are another manifestation of this male domination. Um, now, when Amina Tyler, do you know who, does anybody know who Amina Tyler, the Tunisian, um, Femen protest, there's some nods and some shakes. Okay, so there's a feminist group called Femen, and they basically, they're Ukrainian in origin, their first branch was Ukrainian, and they basically do protests of a political nature, what they consider to be, what they consider to be just causes, but which many consider to be laughable. And uh, they do this by, by they, the way they get attention by, is by doing their protests topless. So basically, it's very much, um, they're supposed to be controversial and they're supposed to try to get people's attention um, for the wrong, obviously the wrong reasons. And they thought that being, you know, advocates of women's rights, that they would basically put themselves on display because that would surely get attention. So one woman, a, Tuni- uh, a Tunisian woman from a Muslim family called Amina, she decided to do a feminine style protest. So she posted pictures of herself. This was quite a big, um, a, a big few raw last year. Um, she, or, or the year before, she posted pictures of herself on the internet, nude, with statements written on her body, like, my body is mine and not the source of anyone's honor. So she had this written across her body. And she was supported by feminists because, not just feminine, but other feminists too, because she was upholding one of the underlying fundamentals of feminism, which is that the idea of ownership over one's own body. So she said, my body is mine. And feminists said, yes, your body is yours. Our bodies are ours to do what we want with them. Now, to give some context, Feminists have long complained, and it's going to get a slightly bit abstract here, but just for two seconds. Feminists have very long, com- for a long time complained that the female, the woman, has been regarded always as being enmeshed in her bodily existence. They call this enmeshment or embodiment. And what they mean by that is that women are seen, are seen as being bodies. They're seen as being just bodies rather than human beings having bodies. Does that make sense? getting some nods, that's good. So they, see, they say that women have always um, been seen as just being bodies, whereas men are always seen as rational and having bodies. Um, so they say that women are somehow perceived as being more biological and more natural than men. So the, 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 you know, summarize it as they say, I am not my body, I own my body. This is what they say. But if we think about it, how exactly do any of us, men or women, How do we own our bodies? If ownership is control, then neither men nor women own our bodies. Did we give birth to ourselves? Can we will against aging or sickness? 
If ownership is not, you know, is not a control, is it maintenance? If it's maintenance, can we survive without depending on other bodies, other human beings? Can we survive without depending on our environment for our continued existence? No. So Islam recognizes that we do not own our own bodies and therefore we do not have complete autonomy over what we do with them, neither men nor women. Instead, Islam says that the body is like, an, is like a trust, it's an amana, and it is entrusted to us and it's our duty to fulfill that trust and to treat the, uh, the body in the way that we are asked to treat it by the creator who created it in the first place. So this is why feminists uh, clash with the, it, it tend to clash with the Islamic concepts of modesty. We say we don't own our bodies, we don't cover for men, we cover for God. But they say, you own your body, you can do with it whatever you want, and you shouldn't have to defer to anyone, whether it's a male man or a male god. You know, unless it's, you know, feminists, you can defer to us, we'll tell you what to do. You, you, you know, our diktats do take priority. But it's funny because feminists have been annoyed that uh, women are not seen as rational beings. However, they have applied the exact same prejudice onto Muslim women. They do not tend to see us as rational beings. So when we say we choose the niqab, or we choose to segregate, or we choose certain roles in life, they say that we must be brainwashed and we must be blindly following a culture developed by men. And they peddle you know, this narrative that basically reduces Muslim men to savage oppressors and Muslim women as mindless victims. So for example, and, and this is just to kind of like crystallize it a little bit, if bad things happen in Western cultures, they're considered to reflect, you know, the, the deviant behavior of a, few, of a few individuals. Instead of, you know, the, the consequences of Western culture itself. But on the other hand, if the same bad thing happens amongst Muslims or amongst other minority cultures, it's considered to be a consequence of their whole belief system. It's not just a few deviant individuals. So, for example, if you see someone called Dave, you know, he's in, walking down the street in Manchester or Southampton and, you know, he throws rubbish on the street, you know, the view won't be, oh, people from Manchester or Southampton are filthy. No, the view will be, you know, Dave's a bit of a, bit of a litter bug. But if Ahmed the Muslim is seen throwing rubbish in the same way, you know, the conclusion more likely will be all of Muslims are filthy and uncivilized. So just to prove this, recently, or, you know, uh, we heard also in the news pretty recently um, of uh, two, two cases of child grooming. So one was a group of Asian men men of an Asian background who were found to be engaging in these horrible things relating to child grooming. And when that happened, um, people of the Asian community were told, you know, you have a cultural problem, you need to sort it out, that's giving rise to this, this, this problem. And then, not so long after, the exact same parallel mirror image incident took place somewhere else in England except it was a group of white men but nobody said oh there's a problem with you know with western culture that's given rise to this no so there's an example of what I mean when I say that when bad things happen in western cultures it's not considered to reflect the ideology but when it happens in Muslim culture suddenly the ideology is blamed we saw the same, for example, with um, Egyptian men who were, uh, the New York Post basically reduced them all to being quote-unquote animals and beasts. They said Egyptian men are animals and beasts because of, uh, there was an incident there where uh, a reporter was um, uh, brutally assaulted while she was in Egypt on the ground. So there's another example. So the assumption is that generally tends to be that people of color or of a certain background are always motivated by culture, whereas what they consider to be Western white people are always motivated by choice or rational thought. So the feminist way of thinking that Muslim women are oppressed and brainwashed um, obviously uh, stems from this and it comes from the European or Western colonialist history in which basically the West constructed the East as being exotic and backward and less enlightened and that they need imperialism to be rescued. And thus, uh, the such types of feminists that I've mentioned also consider Muslim women to be exotic, backward, and less enlightened, and in need of, uh, in need of rescuing from the niqab or segregation from our life choices. 
And of course they're assisted by a number of what we can call native informants like Mona al tahawi or Ayan Hirsi Ali who conveniently you know, confirmed their suspicions um, in these regards. And there's a lot of hist uh, history of this. It's not just what's happening in the modern day. This is actually a very old um, uh, phenomenon that's been going on of trying to uh, suppress um, uh, Muslim women through these kinds of narratives. So for example, you know, uh, Lord Cromer, has anybody had anybody here study history and know of Lord Cromer? He was one of the colonialists of, uh, of the day. Um, and basically, he was a British leader in, e a leader in Egypt. And uh, he accused Egyptians of degrading women through veiling. Um, and he said, you know, this is so degrading. You have to unveil them. And so he tried to, he tried to basically hamper and diminish the practice of the hijab and the veiling in Egypt. And he attempted to show himself as liberating these, these poor women that need rescuing from these you know, brutal and you know, savage Muslim men. Not only that, but in his attempt to liberate them, he actually deprived them of many of the liberations that Islam had given them. So before, they would veil, they would have access to um, all different types of education, and Egypt had a strong culture of training women to be doctors. So Egyptian women would largely, would heavily be, uh, go on to study medicine and become doctors. But uh, so Lord Cromer, in liberating the Muslim women, basically said, our women at home, they don't go to female doctors, they do very well with male doctors, so you can do exactly the same. You can align yourself with, with women in Britain, basically taking away their rights to reduce them to what something that, you know, they had never experienced before. They had always experienced this kind of liberated way of existence. Uh, similarly, uh, it's quite funny because Mary Wollstonecraft, one of the early feminists who wrote about, um, she wrote about uh, women. She was one of the first writers, one of the semin first seminal writers to write about uh, women in England and say that they needed feminism. She said in her introduction, you can go and look it up, she said in her introductory uh, paragraphs or her introduction, she said, we don't want to be oppressed like the Mohammedan women, i.e. the Muslim women. But do you know what was happening at the exact time when she was writing it? Do you know what life was like in the Muslim world? Well, at that time, and it wasn't a long time ago, it was only until as recent as 1924 that this reality existed. But at that time, the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Caliphate, actually treated women so well that non-Muslim women wanted to be treated the same. So I'm going to tell you exactly how that was. In the Ottoman Empire, they didn't have this one rule for all system. They didn't say everybody had to conform to this one ideal. So you know how we're told today that um, Muslim women must, or Muslims must conform to British values. You must basically water down your beliefs until you're the same as everybody else. This is very alien for us because in Islamic history, we never did this to anybody. So in the Ottoman uh, Caliphate, what they would do is they would have an overarching legal system that everybody, regardless of faith, had to abide by. This didn't include acts of worship. This was like if you live in a shared apartment block and you, know, you have the communal areas where everybody abides by the same rules and then you have your own apartment and you can do pretty much what you want. So it was very much the same. They would have different uh, quarters or different, um, different regions where different peoples of different cultures could live and not be forced to conform to this overarching kind of way of being. So they would have the Jewish quarters where the Jews would flourish in their own economy, their own trade, their own culture. They could appoint their own, uh, their own leaders from amongst themselves. They could have their own Jewish courts to resolve their disputes. They didn't have to go to Islamic courts to resolve their own disputes. They had a similar quarter for the Christian community, exactly the same, to allow them to flourish without forcing them to be something they were not. The same for the Armenians, the same for every different cultural group that there was. Now, although non-Muslim women had access to, their, to courts of their own beliefs, so Jewish women could go to Jewish courts, Christian women could go to Christian courts, they preferred to go to Islamic courts because Islamic courts were seen to be much more favorable to women's rights than their own courts were. So they would say no thanks to their own courts and go to the Islamic courts. This was at the time when Mary Wollstonecraft was saying that they did not want to be like the Mohammedan women. And just like today, this is because of ignorance of the reality of what Islam actually says. 
The difference today is that we don't have a living example of what Islam would look like in practice. We have to refer to historical examples when Islam was actually implemented in full because in today's world there are no um, Islamic countries. We have Muslim countries which are basically secular so they're founded on or they, um, they run on secular principles, they have secular governments and they have a few strands of, of, the, of you know, the, the most graphic parts of Islamic law which when taken out of context um, you know, look the way they do in the Muslim world today. So the arguments that are used against Muslim women and just to come back to the example that we were on, the niqab for example, are full of contradictions. So we talked about the niqab, we talked about feminist concept of modesty, uh, we talked about um, uh, where this comes from, i.e. historical colonialism and imperialist thought, why this was wrong. And so let's come back to um, the niqab itself. So there are arguments against the niqab, so we know how to deconstruct them and we can see them for what they are in today's world. They're full of contradictions. So niqab wearing women are being classed as either intimidating social deviants or intimidated victims. You know, you can't be both. It has to be one or the other. And so we see that the opposition is very schizophrenic in their claims. And I'm going to give you some examples. So please listen for the contradictions. First, the niqab is forced on women against their will. So these women must be forced to remove it. Second, the niqab is a restriction on women's life choices, so these women should be denied the choice to wear it. And this one is my favourite. The niqab is both demeaning to men, but it's also imposed by men, implying that men impose the niqab to demean themselves. The niqab is a form of sexual objectification, so Muslim women should reveal their bodies just like anybody else. The niqab is antisocial, so let's ban it effectively confining these women to their homes, just like what happened in France. The niqab makes women invisible, and seeing them is really scary. <laughs> the niqab inhibits communication, even if niqab-wearing women tell us otherwise, and even ignoring the fact that even surgeons wearing face masks you know, they communicate just fine when they're performing open-heart surgery or saving lives you know, in the ER. Now, do these views sound like, you know, rational thought? Are Muslims being asked to conform to this? Are Muslims being asked to take these arguments seriously? Maybe we should present what we believe about modesty and ask to see if they present any contradictions. If Islam presents any contradictions, then we should debate that and we should discuss that and show the hikmah, i.e. the wisdom behind why Islam says what it does about modesty, about um, life roles and about segregation and these things. The reality is that feminism itself is a pretty reactive ideology that has blindly followed Western philosophy of individualism. Feminists claim to abhor following cultures defined by men, but as I mentioned earlier, they advocate terms like equality and individual, individualism, which were coined by male thinkers. And in any case, they're euphemistic terms. If you, even if you want to say, okay, fine, you know, they, they took these terms from men because they, they thought that these were good values. Even, even then, their euphemistic use of the terms like equality, freedom and empowerment are very different to the Islamic equivalents of these things. We don't have the same meaning, we have, different, uh, we have a different understanding of equality, we have a different understanding of the individual um, uh, and of liberation and of, of power. We have a completely different understanding when it comes to power. And in practice we find that actually the, the, liberal, like the liberal understanding of, the, of these terms, equality, um, freedom and empowerment, are actually very contradictory. It's like calling equality, freedom and empowerment is a bit like calling out rock, paper, scissors. Does everybody know rock, paper, scissors? Or ching, chang, walla, some people may have called it. Um, each one intrinsically limits the other. Freedom, equality and empowerment, each one limits the other. For example, if everyone is equal in the eyes of the law, then if I empower one of you, i.e. give you an advantage, then everybody's equality is negated. If, uh, equality, um, if everybody has equality, equality then also constricts your freedom to do something that everybody else is not doing, because it forces you all to be uniform, it forces you all to be the same. And if you want to maintain your individual freedom, then that denies somebody else's power over you as well. So as we can see, 
They all limit each other and in effect they all cancel each other out on some level. But let's consider the so-called um, feminist progress towards equality, freedom and empowerment that they want Muslim women to emulate. The reason I mention them is because many of the criticisms or the claims that Muslim women are oppressed come from these quarters or are, you know, are formulated by these quarters. And they want us to take on um, <coughs> feminist values or liberal values of, um, and they want us to embody them and they want us to um, resemble, resemble how, how, how women, uh, non-Muslim women, those who uh, who pursued uh, feminism or Western ideology or liberal ideology as a way of life. They want us to resemble that. So let's look at some of the so-called successes of feminism. And I'm always asked, I'm often asked about some of the examples that, oh, you know, you're not talking about mainstream feminists, you're talking about radical feminists and they're not all the same. But I'm going to tell you now, before I read these examples, these are all mainstream feminists. So, the first one. Uh, feminists demanding that women's treatment, they say that it should never be influenced by their gender. They say a woman's treatment should never be influenced by the fact that she is a woman. But at the same time, they cite biological factors when they say that women with PMS should be considered to have diminished legal responsibility, i.e. it should be a legal defence if they commit the crime. And so they should be less accountable when breaking the law. And they also actually have a very sexist campaign to close down female prisons, but not male prisons, because they say female prisons are not really conducive to women's nature. As though it's conducive to men's nature. So this, and like I said, this is not a radical feminist movement. These are mainstream feminists. You can even look this particular thing up on the Fawcett Society, which is one of the oldest um, feminist uh, societies in Britain, and its members, its membership is uh, by very prominent people who are policy makers in this country. Um, secondly, sexist quotas to get women into jobs based on gender rather than merit. In Islam, we talk about a meritocracy and not just giving people things because of their certain gender. They have the lavishing of attention on female learning needs, so much so that now university chiefs have considered male students to be a disadvantaged group. They consider male students to be a disadvantaged group when it comes to universities. So how is that for equality? There are indicators of a positive correlation between the rise of uh, feminism and the rise of divorce, with women being liberated from their marriages and children being liberated from their, from their parents. The suffragettes, everyone pretty much agrees that the suffragettes, you know, they're not radical, they're pretty foundational, we have statues of them. The suffragettes' use of what would, in today's, in the modern day, it would actually be classed as terrorist activity. They had letter bombs, property damage, even injuries to, uh, to others, just to get the chance to vote in a system that doesn't benefit anybody but the elite anyway. They earn themselves the right to be taxed and become debt slaves to the modern capitalist state, just like their fellow men. And not to mention now the resulting backlash from many men's rights movements as well. So as we can see, rather than fixing the oppression that feminists complained about, feminists are simply reversing it. So with a car crash record like this, would Muslims, who have a perfectly defined and complete system to establish the rights, of due, the rights and duties of, of men and women, why would we want to emulate <coughs> the extreme and confused culture of feminism or liberalism? Why would we want to yield to their irrational criticism of our concepts of modesty, our concepts of inheritance laws, our concepts of family structures. If Muslims in today's world are oppressed, it's because of the absence of Islam and not because of Islam itself. So those Muslims uh, who uh, they work for and look towards the implementation of, the, of, uh, of their rights in the, Muslim, in the Muslim world, they advocate the full implementation of the Islamic legal system to guarantee their rights and so that they do have recourse to justice, not just women, but men too. As for those men and women who subscribe, and I don't just mean uh, non-Muslim men and women, I mean Muslim men and women too, who subscribe to some of the contradictory liberal values that I've talked about today. That is oppression, because that is oppression when the system actually works. When liberalism works, it oppresses people. When Islam doesn't work, people are oppressed. When Islam works, they are liberated. 
So I invite those who subscribe to those values to, um, to question and consider alternative values and I hope that those answers come to you um, from Islam itself. Um, I just want to finish up by giving like a quick rundown because of uh, some of the, of the facts of what Islam says about women in Islam. Just a very brief um, uh, category by category, you know, some of the rights and, and uh, you know, uh, duties that are afforded to women. So first of all, parity. Islam says that to men and women, it doesn't just say men and women, it says all human beings basically are start on an equal footing. Everybody has an equal shot. Nobody is by birth privileged. Nobody is by birth disadvantaged. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, said people are equal as the teeth of a comb. So black, white, male, female, whatever, everybody is equal as the teeth of a comb. That doesn't mean that everybody is identical in their needs. That doesn't mean that everybody is identical in their abilities. We see that not even two human beings are the same as each other. Everybody has a different strength. Everybody has a different intellect. Everybody has a different interest. Everybody has a different appearance. Islam, however, says that you start on an equal par. Men and women start on an equal par. And you can compete to be good. But what you compete in is righteousness. So, um, in Islam, we are told that the best of you are those who are most righteous of you. It doesn't say righteous and male of you. It doesn't say, you know, those who are most righteous and female of you. It says those who are most righteous of you. It doesn't talk about gender. And uh, in Islam, because it's about women, I'm going to point out some women-specific um, uh, kind of uh, embellishments uh, for women. So, uh, being a, a female, even as a, even as a child, even as a girl, without you even being fully, you know, um, uh, mature yet of, of, of your own faculties, you basically are a gateway to paradise for your parents. So, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, whoever has a daughter and does not treat her lesser than a son and is good to her and raises her, you know, properly and justly, um, will be, you know, will be in paradise. So, even as a child, she is basically a gateway to paradise for her parents. Uh, as they, uh, as women, as mothers, uh, are basically due, um, due the respect of their children, so much so that somebody asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, who do I owe my time to? Like, with whom should I, who, who should I prioritize in spending my time? And the Prophet said that you should spend your time, he said, your mother. And then the man asked three times, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, three times said, your mother, your mother is basically most deserving of, of your time and, and your affection and all of it. And, and then he asked the fourth time, and then the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, your father. So we're also told that uh, for Muslims, paradise lies at the feet of the mother, not the father. In other words, um, being good to your mother and respecting your mother is one of the most highest, sort of, um, is most, one of the most highest uh, values one of the most highest fundamentals or ethics or beautiful things in Islam. For every human being, which human being doesn't have a mother? Very few. So the, the uh, respect for the mother is put on that level. Uh, economically, economically, if a, uh, if a woman, uh, a woman basically does not have to work, obviously there are matters of, of sometimes of compulsion, but generally the, the standard rule or the general status quo is that the woman is not obliged to earn for the family. Rather, the woman has um, a kind of a right to be, uh, to be provided for by her husband or by her father or by male relatives. She doesn't have to have the burden of providing for everybody or anybody. If she does work, if she does choose to work, nobody has a right to her income. Nobody has a right to what she earns. She can spend it on her family if she wants to, but nobody can force her to do so. When it comes to inheritance, uh, it is correct that the male receives um, more than what the female receives. And if we look at this with very materialistic you know, lenses, as most people do these days, we would say, oh, that means that you know, in Islam women are worth less. But we don't actually value people by how much they earn or how much money they have or how much money they get. These are really materialistic ideas. We look at these things in a very practical and administrative way. So if the man is obliged to provide for the women of the family, he receives an extra portion from any inheritance that they receive for this very purpose. So he receives this extra portion, which is more like a trust. It's more like a trust. And the beneficiaries are the women. So basically he has to administer that for the use of providing for the family. And if he doesn't, then what does, the, what does the woman have the right to do? Either she can take within reasonable means 
uh, from his wealth to, to run the family or whatever necessity requires. Or she can go to the state, if there is an Islamic state, she can go to the courts and say, my husband is neglecting his duty, he has enough to provide, he's just not giving it, um, then they can compel him to do so. So that extra fund, she has a right over it. Purely for administrative reasons, because in the eyes of the law, um, he is, or the male is kind of accountable for anything that goes wrong, financially, economically, he is accountable to the state for what's happening with the affairs of this family. So that's a little bit about the economics. And, you know, we talk about, I talked earlier about gender roles and how sometimes, you know, women prefer to be wives and mothers. And that is generally, most women in the world at some point will go through that in their lives at some point. But Islam also does, you know, give examples of, you know, women who work and women who are very ambitious. The first wife of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was his employer. She employed him. She was a businesswoman. He was her employee. And uh, we also see, for example, in Islamic history, uh, for example, again, referring back to the, the, um, the Ottoman state, and I refer to it because it's the most recent, it's not like it was 100,000 years ago, it was, you know, as recent as 1924. Women were so active in, in economics, they were so active in, in careers that in many areas, they actually had monopolies. They had monopolies in some areas, such that the government and trade unions had to intervene and kind of, you know, break it up a little. They were like cartels almost. Um, <laughs> So, you know, obviously that's not good either, so Islam obviously doesn't allow monopolies. Um, but just to show that, you know, Muslim women, when the Islamic State is working, have the capability or the, the resources or the access to develop themselves in that way if they want to. But again, there's no obligation on them to do that. Uh, politically, uh, in Islam, uh, a, woman, a woman's pledge to the ruler is the same as a man's pledge to the ruler. A pledge to the ruler is kind of the equivalent of what you would have as a vote today, but in your overarching system it works out very differently. But the pledge is the equivalent, and a, men, a, a woman and a man's pledge are the same. Uh, not only that, but uh, women, just as men, are actually almost obliged to be politically aware and politically involved. They have an equal obligation to account the ruler if the ruler is corrupt or tyrannical. Um, and they are basically, it is, it is a requirement almost to have full knowledge and keep up to date with current affairs and know what's going on. It's not like you can shut yourself away in your home and be completely oblivious because in doing so you are not fulfilling the duty of what Islam asks us to do which is commanding the good and forbidding what is not good. So commanding the good and forbidding the bad. And we have this duty not just between um, friends, not just between colleagues, but between husband and wife, between ruler and the rules. Um, throughout society we have this obligation. And the woman's political, uh, political role is such that even if she gives refuge to an enemy of the state, if she gives refuge to an enemy of the state, the ruler has to abide by the refuge that she has given. He has to abide by her word um, on the trust that basically she's done it with good knowledge. It doesn't say you're just a woman, get out of the way, we, you know, this guy the one says. No, it kind of, it, it says, okay, this woman's given a word on our behalf, so we have to value that. So those are some of the of some of the kind of generic points that always need to be reiterated as well about women in Islam. And no matter how many times we say them, sometimes they are forgotten, or sometimes are uh, you know they are washed away or drowned out by the, what the media has to say about Muslim women, rather than what Islam has to say about Muslim women. And just to emphasise, because this, just to finish up, this point always comes up as well about well that all sounds great on paper, but why are we not seeing it today? And as I said, the reason is because we don't have uh, an Islamic country anywhere in the world today. We have many Muslim countries that are founded on or run on secular values, but not on Islamic, uh, fully on Islamic uh, law and Islamic legal system. So uh, to end, when we ask whether Muslim women are oppressed or liberated, we see that uh, those who are subjected to liberal values, not just Muslim women, but women in general, not just women, but men, um, not just in this country, but pretty much all over the world. Um, there is wholesale oppression worldwide, and when we just pick out the topic of women, um, we are actually um, only doing selective, a selective examination of what's really going on, and this is in itself an injustice. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> the crash happened, it was basically because the money wasn't actually real, it was all just um, fluffed up, it was kind of, uh, you know, not real wealth, so all these, all these mortgages, that were based on, you know, promises, uh, you know, they, they all backfired in a kind of domino effect and that's, why, that's what happened. So 
if you want to talk about, you know, who is it failing and, and you know, what, you know, who, in, a, in a sarcastic way, like who is it kind of, you know, not helping, um, you can see that the credit crunch pretty much screwed a lot of people over. Um, and that was all based on, you know, interest-based banking, which Islam actually, you know, prohibits. As for debt, Islam takes a different view. It doesn't say that, you know, if you are indebted, it's all fine and good. We have a very strong concept of accountability. So, as far as the benefit system is concerned, we consider that to be, you are accountable. There's nothing, you know, there's no, basically, you can't really take, like, a free ride. You can't, um, uh, you have to be in a, in a, in a state of, of serious necessity or requirements. Uh, if you take um, if you loan money, uh, the debt is considered to be such a grave burden that you know upon your debt, if you haven't paid it, there will be certain consequences. Uh, if you are somebody who is a creditor, you are obliged to you're not obliged, but you are encouraged often to waive the debt because for us it's not just about what happens in this material world. Our concept of justice extends to also what happens in the next life, and anything that is not settled here is inevitably settled. Um, ultimately, uh, in the in the grand scale of, of things, so just to say, oh, you know, I might not get a job, and now I will have to pay it anyway. It's not really, it's not really a, a viable way for humanity uh, to kind of uh, get by in the long term. It might be working for some students now, but there's also, you know, the kind of myth that, you know, as long as you get a good degree, you get a good job, and then everything will be okay. But you know, post 2008, students discovered a very different reality. It's not just about getting a good degree. And it's frightening to think of right now as students, um, and I hope that by the time you graduate, you won't have to face this problem. But the reality is, with the capitalist system, it's going to have booms and buttons, it's going to go in these cycles. And if it hasn't, you know, it happened now, for a time it will improve, and then it will happen again, and we'll be faced with the same problem. Should we go to a different question? Maybe that's not related to, you know, economics, but more on topic? Um, <laughs> the with the blue hoodie and then one. Hi. Um, my question comes from uh, the position uh, of having spoken to some of my friends in public health service in the NHS. Uh, that's, my, uh, <coughs> that's the perspective uh, which I'm speaking from. Uh, but what's your views on uh, genital mutilation? Okay, genital mutilation. So when we hear about, uh, so the, if I think everybody heard him as a very clear speaker, he's asking what my views are on genital mutilation or what is abbreviated as FGM. Um, and it constantly comes up in the media. And we hear about, oh, you know, Muslims, uh, they do this barbaric thing of, you know, uh, female genital mutilation. And, okay, I'm going to go into it. Now, in Islam, we have circumcision. We have male circumcision, and for some people, they consider that there's also a form of female circumcision. Now, what we see in the media uh, that's coming out of some countries is a very barbaric form of of circumcision that is taking place in the world. And it is encouraged and exacerbated by often many cultural forces. So, originally, female genital mutilation preceded Islam. It was there before Islam came. When Islam came, Islam, just like the other Abrahamic religions, had male circumcision. Um, it is narrated that the Prophet, peace be upon him, visited a certain town where they already practiced female genital mutilation. And a woman came and asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, we're doing this, is it okay? And he was just like, um, you know, only if you, you know, and he explained the parameters, he explained the very strict provisions and the very strict guidelines and um, that it had to be done so that it was, you know, minimal and painless, so that it was like, just like the male circumcision. But what we have, what we see now is basically a very barbaric form that was practiced before Islam and without restriction. And it's quite ironic because the West has its own form of female genital mutilation, labiaplasty, which is a big thing these days. Women, you know, voluntarily going to clinics and, you know, having things done down there. Uh, but we don't say, you know, oh, objectification and, you know, uh, concepts of, you know, female beauty are oppressing these women to do that. No. We say, oh, well, then it's a choice. Then they can do that freely. So there's, there's a few points that you have to be careful of when you talk about female genital mutilation. The first is, one, it preceded Islam, and Islam came to regulate it so that it was the same or as same as possible as male circumcision. And secondly, the fact that it takes place today under a different guise um, just for the pursuit of some uh, beauty ideal, but we don't question that in the same way. Um, two questions to really follow up that. Uh, first of all, uh, my impression of the male circumcision as given to Abraham was one to establish the 
covenant between Abraham and, and God, one which, uh, which is why he then proceeded to uh, circumcise both Isaac and Ishmael, I'm sure you know. Um, so, in that sense, it's, it's, it's something which didn't predate Abraham, it's something which came from Abraham's day to establish a covenant between God and Abraham. That's what that's my understanding of it. In which, in which case, my first question is, uh, what is the role of female circumcision? Uh, second question, um, do females, to, to this, this is an, an, an exploratory question, uh, do uh, females today undergo voluntary uh, gen- gentle mutilation? Uh, you mentioned the, uh, females who go to hospitals voluntarily, uh, who, uh, who can go for female circumcision today, um, but uh, with the case of gentle mutilation, is that voluntary as well? That's question number two. Okay, so just like, um, let me answer in reverse order. So the que- second question was, is female genital mutilation voluntary? Well, if you have it done as a child or as a baby, then obviously not. Just like male circumcision is not. Just like getting your ears pierced as a child is not. Just like when your parents dictate to you certain values and beliefs, those are also not within your choice. Often as children, our parents do things for us and to us, and they have that right as parents to do so. That's very different. That's also like male circumcision. As for the role of female circumcision, well, it is intended in its original, in the proper form, it's actually intended to enhance uh, the pleasure of a woman in the same way that women today go to clinics to have it done. The result of the barbaric form is that it has the opposite effect. So when it's done in the wrong way, it has the opposite effect and it makes things uh, very painful for women. So that's the response to your first question. Um, obviously, the origins from the Abrahamic tradition, um, there are many things from the Abrahamic tradition that Muslims have carried on, like the concept of the hijab or the covering, we've carried this on. The hikmah or the wisdom behind it has often been re-explained um, through the different religions and it's clearly explained different things in different ways. So, I hope that answers your question. Um, thank you. So, what it comes to be on a secularism, uh, Islam's view on secularism. Okay, so the brother has asked, what is Islam's view on secularism? And I mentioned secularism during my presentation. Now, Islam is a very holistic system. So I mentioned how women had roles in the economy, women had roles in politics, women had roles on a social level. And this hints at the reality, I was just hinting there, that Islam actually has um, a system for everything in society. It has a system of economy, politics, government, uh, charity, everything. It has a holistic system. And so when, uh, for example, different religions like Christianity underwent a so-called reformation, basically a secularization of their religion, that was intended in the first place to stop um, different sects or different groups of Christians fighting with each other. So it wanted to establish the lowest common denominator between them. And many people would like Islam to go through a similar reformation, basically secularize Islam. What this means is they want Islam, like Christianity, to become something that is just a a matter of private worship. It's just something that you do in your homes, you don't bring it to the public sphere. So all Islam's beliefs about economy and politics should be disregarded. This is what they ask um, Muslims to do. Secularism is, is not, is not a compatible with Islam because Islam has a view on how society should be governed. Islam was revealed as a complete way of life, not just for one man living in a bubble, but how we interact with each other and how society should be governed and how we should be protected and how we should protect others. So as far as Islam goes, um, secularism is, is outside of Islam. It's something that we don't subscribe to. It's something that steals, it takes away from Islam. It reduces Islam to something that is, that is, that is not. Basically, I'm from India. Basically, um, my question is, uh, if, you, uh, if you believe that secularism is, is, doesn't have been, uh, if, if you uh, reject the idea of secularism, then, then uh, how is that? I mean, uh, it's, it's because of Britain, it's, it's because Britain is secular and there are other Muslims here. If, uh, because of India is secular, the Muslims are being, uh, in, uh, have their own faith and uh, they can practice their religion there. Even though the majority of them, majority of India is uh, a multi-religious group. And, uh, uh, the government also subsidizes uh, 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 people, uh, Muslims, for Hajj. So, so it's, it's just not. Uh, I, mean, uh, I understand your question. So the uh, brother saying is that it, it is that in sec- it's because Britain is secular that lots of Muslims can can live here. Um, well, <laughs> most of the things I raised in my presentation. Most of the arguments against women in Islam come from a secular ideology. They come from a secular liberal ideology. Are they letting us live here in peace? Um, Not, you know, not entirely. 
I also, you know, and just to say that secularism uh, accommodates people of different religions, one, it doesn't because it forces us all to conform, as I was saying. Secondly, Islam already showed a better way to accommodate people of different religions. If you want to talk about pluralism or multiculturalism, the model I described earlier of how the Islamic State allows different cultural groups to live according to their own values without forcing them to, to conform to one law for all, we already have a system that does that in a better way. So why do we need to turn to secularism to teach us a, a way that has caused problems for people? Why do we need secularism to teach us a lesser way of doing that? Any questions on women in Islam? <laughs> Uh, uh, let's come to this. To yeah, we've come back. Women we've in the South question. We can talk about those ones afterwards. Um, Should yeah. we come down um, here? And sorry. Do, do, do yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've just been puzzling out how to actually phrase this because <laughs> the phrasing and everything. But I very strongly believe that um, the the term post-feminism is an extremely dangerous term. Post-feminism. Post-feminism because it creates this kind of consciousness that. Oh, we've had our main battles. Mary Wollstonecraft wrote the Vindication of the Rights of Women. Suffragettes had horrific things done to them in order to get the equality which Muslim women have had for ages before. Um, so it kind of, always to me, that is a very loaded term because it, it, it implies that our fight is done. And so you don't need to worry, you know, I'm, I'm putting it all in quotes, Western women. Everything's fine, everything's good, everything's liberal. But in fact, we need to value women so much better um, as human beings actually and in terms of equality if you're talking about equality in terms of spiritually um, because you know a, a woman's soul and a man's soul in Islam are absolutely equal at the feet of God is that not yes. true so how can we as women as ambassadors for Islam as sisters mothers whatever we hopefully will go on to be or have been how can we remind people almost to not be comfortably stuck in this belief that everything's fine because injustices in terms of representation of women are and exploitation of women, especially in terms of objectification, are still heavily right? Okay, so to crystallise what the sister has said, she's saying that you know some feminists say that um, you know uh, the fight's done, basically everything's fine, and the sister's concerned that women will become complacent. Well, the good news is that many feminists don't say the fight is done. Many feminists say that there's still so much to do. But as Muslims, um, we should uh, to not... It's not about complacency. It's about advocating the right values. And those values don't come from feminism for Muslims. Those values, we believe, come from Islam. And they provide a better, uh, a better format for society. As Muslim women... Our role is to be um, is to be examples of that and to advocate Islamic justice for Muslim women. In Muslim countries, we should advocate that you know Muslim governments implement the rights for Muslim men and women in full. And in the West, we should uh, revive the intellect of the Muslims about women in Islam. We should revive the intellect about our knowledge of how men and women are supposed to interact in Islam. And we should be good examples, and we should be living examples of what Islam uh, affords to, to men and women about the rights between men and women such that just as in the uh, Ottoman state where the non-Muslim women wanted to live like the Muslim women we should be advocating the same example today the reality is we are very far from that so some action points from what you say I would say is that there is certainly no complacency rather there is this um, a further fight from all sides to try to say you know feminists will say oh you know we haven't reached our goals but this is because feminists haven't defined any goals because they don't know what it should look like in Islam we know what it should look like we're told by the creator what it should look like and we've lived that experience in our history so if I could get the lady in the green jumper fast and then the brother in the end in the suit yeah okay Um, if women can participate in all aspects of society, why can't they pray in public? I must say, I've never heard that women can't pray in public. I've heard that there are, for example, uh, in Islam, you know, women can, you know, pray in congregations just as men pray in congregations. I've heard that, um, uh, basically, I think I know what you mean by this question, so I'll explain. 
Some people say that, you know, women shouldn't come to mosques because if there's not enough space, then, you know, men should take priority. First of all, I mean, and this comes up a lot, that women are not allowed in mosques, and, you know, in some mosques, not all of them, but some mosques. Now, first of all, mosques itself, uh, today, they are not what they were traditionally. A mosque uh, in history was supposed to be, or in Islam, is supposed to be a central social hub. It's supposed to be a hub where Muslims, men and women, come together, although segregated, come together, discuss the issues of the day, they also pray, they learn there, they have educational seminars, they, um, you know, they meet each other, they greet each other. It's supposed to be a place of, uh, of cultivation of, of society's knowledge and their, and their way of life. However, today it's just become somewhere that people just go to pray and they leave, by and large. And so when Muslim women are saying, oh, we want to be inside these mosques, I would say, I would, you know, just set up new mosques open to men and women that actually do the function that they're, you know, the whole of the function that they're supposed to do. Or advocate that these mosques change their setup so that they do all of those things as well. Um, some people say, um, maybe, maybe what you're implying or maybe what, what has come to you is that when women can't pray in public, they mean that they shouldn't pray in front of men. And there's a very simple reason for this, and this is that part of the, so, so some people, well, it is true that women should pray behind men. And this is not because of some inferiority or that women are lesser than men. It's actually because of a preservation of modesty. So part of the prayer involves bending down and then going onto the ground. And so if women are praying in front of men, it can be very distracting for some men to see a woman from behind bending down and going onto the ground. This is the simple reason why, this is the simple reason why women in Islam do not pray in front of men. And sometimes perhaps then why people might say that women should avoid praying, like in, in open public where there's passers by and things like this. Unless, you know, they're back at trouble or something like that. But this is this very simple practical reason why, you know, uh, there are certain uh, layouts, like a, you know, a layout for how, how, how we pray in congregation. You could have a Can take, you know, can take four wives. Now, the Quran 
possibly forgot who they were. So we're taking, um, so we're taking dozens of wives, not looking after them, oppressing them, um, neglecting them, treating them very badly. That's the concept of the, of the oppressed wife, maybe you refer to. They were treating them that way. Uh, the Quran came and said, take one wife, or you know, two, or three, or four, only if you can treat them equally. So first, it's like a challenge. Can you treat them equally? First of all, it's impossible to treat even two people equally. But that's not to say that the Quran isn't actually giving permission. The Quran is giving permission for those who want to take more than one wife. However, we also know from Islamic law that uh, you can stipulate as a woman when you get married that you will not permit your husband to take a second wife. And if he does, it immediately, basically, is causing an automatic divorce. So women also have certain rights. Secondly, um, polygamy, you know, why should we take it away from people who prefer it? Some women, you know, in this culture it's not common, so we find it very strange. We grew up with the fairy tale idea, prince, princess, one man, one woman. In other cultures, you know, they have different ideas. You know, um, so in other cultures, some women prefer it. Some women prefer to have what they, what they call a co-wife. So, you know, they would divide the labour, things like that. I'll go out to work, you do this one day. And so, for them it works out, you know. It's a different, it's a different, uh, a different concept that you're raised with and a different comfort level. And if you don't want that, you know, you don't, you're not forced to stay in such, you're not forced to engage in a marriage where your husband will do that. You're not being forced to, to stay in a marriage that Islam does give the right to divorce. Um, but also... What if I'm in love with my husband? Pardon? What if I'm in love with my husband? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a very personal kind of example. Maybe you can just Everything but the face and hands, as a minimum, 
it, the, you know, some consider this is this is the minimum that everybody agrees on, or the different has had. This is what should be covered. I remember one sister asked me, "Do I have to cover my head if I shave my hair off?" And um, and I thought about it, and actually it was a good question because it made me realise that it's not about covering the hair, but the point is what you are allowed to leave uncovered. So what you are allowed to leave uncovered is the face and hands. Whatever you think of your beauty or anything else is irrelevant, basically, because different people are attracted to different things. Maybe someone is attracted to a female bald head, but ultimately you have to cover everything but the, but the face and hands. Then there are some who will say that the verses which are directed at the wives of the Prophet, so the verses in the Qur'an which were considered to be directed at the wives of the Prophet of Islam, in which they were told to stay, um, speak behind screens, so to stay behind screens, um, I, I cover their, you know, so cover, not show their faces. Some people would say that this should also apply to all women. So there are legitimate opinions where uh, some women believe that this is also uh, an obligation. So there are different opinions within Islam, but we respect all of those opinions. And so for those women who wish to cover their faces, we, we support them and we protect their rights when those rights are threatened, uh, just as we protect the rights of sisters who, who don't wear it and who, who wear a different type of hijab. So.